Hello and welcome to Focus North. I'm Marie Wilson. This week we bring you the third and final edition of our special series on alcohol abuse. The story's been told so far through the eyes of the people of Alkali Lake, British Columbia, and through a two-part film they made called The Honor of All. The film has shown you some of the horror stories so often associated with alcoholism, but it has also shown you how a community can turn itself around and get back on its feet once it gets rid of the bottle. Today, after a 15-year struggle, 95% of the people of Alkali are sober, and they are an example and an inspiration to others. That inspiration has rubbed off here in the north, where most communities could tell their own alcohol story, complete with many of the same tragic chapters you saw in the Alkali Lake films. Today you will be told some of those northern chapters, not with gruesome pictures, but through the sober and heartfelt reflections of Dene people in the Mackenzie Valley. Inspired by Alkali, many are taking steps to turn things around here, too. The first step, to admit there is a problem, and more and more, that's been happening. I'm not that old, but I've seen a lot of people died with alcohol. A lot of them. I've seen all kinds, I've seen houses burn, I've seen people screaming their heads out from inside the fire there. I've seen it burn, alive. Chief Joe Rabiska of Fort Ray painted this painful picture just over a year ago. It was at a special alcohol conference in Hay River held by the Dene Nation. Henry Toback of Fort Good Hope started drinking when he was 13. Through his own sad tale, he says people here will have to find the solutions within themselves. I started using knives, guns, everything that I could use. I come very close to killing a man. I started going to jail. The end of the Hay River Conference was a time to celebrate. This was the first alcohol conference of its kind among the Dene. Important resolutions had been passed, including a call for sober leadership. This was a first step. A few months later, the Dene National Assembly would pass a motion clearing the way for a series of alcohol workshops in each of the five Dene regions. One of the workshops, the last of the five, was held just last month in Fort Resolution. Neatly tucked on the south shore of Great Slave Lake, this small community appears so well organized. Yet this image is in sharp contrast to the social turmoil that has been part of Fort Resolution over the years. For all its peaceful appearance, Fort Res has had its share of alcohol casualties. It is a town with more job options than many others. The wealth of dogs and skidoos are proof that many people still do the traditional ones, hunting and trapping. Others work for the community council or at the school. But there's also a sawmill here, and for years, it's kept many of the adults employed, at least part of the year. And Fort Resolution has one other thing that many communities do not have, a road out of town. It leads to bigger centers, places with bars and liquor stores. And over the years, some have said it is the road to trouble. But with or without a road, Fort Resolution is not alone in its trouble. People from the communities of Snowdrift and Fort Smith have also come to this alcohol workshop. They have also known the knifings, the shootings, the suicides, all the alcohol horror stories that have taken place in their own hometowns. So at this Fort Resolution workshop, they are united in tragedy and in the hope that something can be done to find a better way. These are the people who will guide the way, Andy and Phyllis Chelsea of Alkali Lake, British Columbia, the chief and his wife who set their community on the road to sobriety and who set the example that would inspire everyone here. Harold Belmont of the state of Washington. Martha Many Grey Horses from Southern Alberta. These two have also fought the battle of alcohol and lived to tell the tale. Both are trained social and spiritual leaders among their own people. And they begin the workshop by calling upon the spiritual strength of the people here. And to give respect and recognition to the teachings of the old people. 
we would like to invite our elder from Snowdrift, Zeb Cassaway, if he would come forward and he'd help us this morning and offer up those words to the creator of all good things. <laughs> Prayers for guidance and strength, prayers that for some are soon answered through the presence of the next two speakers. It's uh, my privilege at this point uh, to introduce you to the chief of the Alkali Lake Indian Band, Chief Andy Chelsea. I'm here to help you and I'm here to tell you my story. Part of Andy Chelsea's life will sound all too familiar to native people here in the north. How he was sent to mission school as a young boy. How his braids were cut off and thrown into the stove to burn along with his homemade vest and more. And I couldn't speak English. So when he talked to me in English, I couldn't answer him back. So I started getting slept around the first hour I was there. And that hurt. And I know I hated the priests, the brother, the brother that did that. But over the years, despite the hurt and the hate and the alcohol, Chief Chelsea has learned lessons, some of them from the examples of nature. Take the beaver building a dam, for example. And watch those beaver and work. They work and they work and they work. Is what happens to the water. The water keeps coming, coming, coming. Does the water give up? No. Does the beaver give up? No. It's a learning experience, you never quit. It's a learning experience right there. Where are all those hurts? How come we keep backing down those hurts? If we want to get rid of it, we talk about it. If we keep packing them, packing it down, then those hurts will build up. People who bottle up their feelings always seem to turn to the bottle for relief. So don't do it. This is the lesson Andy Chelsea and his wife Phyllis have learned the hard way. Good morning, everybody. And like almost everyone else in this room, Phyllis Chelsea has lots of hurt inside, but she doesn't bury it, she lets it out. I saw my dad beating up my mom. And I remember my dad dragging my mom around by the hair and there was nobody around the head. And I remember my dad beating me up when I was 17. And I wanted to die, I hated him. I had no respect for him at all. These are not easy things to talk about, especially to tell how one day the dad simply disappeared. You have never been able to find out to this day what happened to my dad. It wasn't easy after she got married either. There was more drinking and there was fighting. To be with Andy, I was scared. So it was with the love for my kids that I, I stayed and I I decided to take that step, you know, to, to leave alone alcohol. And I'm really glad I did. Somehow I know somebody was praying for me and somebody was caring about me. And then somehow all that also happened for Andy. Today, those kids are really strong. The strength comes from leaving alcohol behind. Even in translation into Chippewyan, this message comes through loud and clear. Marcy, just. The morning had moved many to tears. After lunch, many others would be moved to share some of their own feelings. 
It was after lunch that the Fort Resolution group would watch the Alkali Lake film together. Many had already seen it a few weeks earlier on television when we first broadcast it on Focus North, and they had been deeply moved. In fact, that was what drew many of the participants to this workshop, especially the local people from Fort Resolution. This was their chance to meet Andy and Phyllis Chelsea in person, not as movie stars, but as ordinary people with alcohol problems like their own. And after spending the morning listening to the Chelsea's talk about their past, they would now watch the Alkali Lake film for the second time with all the more admiration for the way the people of Alkali had tackled their alcohol problems and won. You cure any damn ailment you got. It's powerful medicine. Andy Chelsea is watching his own story for the 28th time, and still it makes him shake his head. One day our little girl refused to come home with us. She was only seven years old. She was fed up with our drinking. Phyllis didn't want her daughter to hate her or to leave her. That was Phyllis's turning point. This is probably one of the most profound films that we've been able to share and experience in our lives. The honor of all, the Alkali Lake story. What did you see? What did you hear? And how did it make you feel? Would you help me out, please? Hello, my name is Patrick Simon. I'm from Fort Rez. <clears throat> in terms of what I saw, I saw something very emotional from 100 down to 5%. That's awesome. I'd like to call Andy and Phyllis up here and to personally thank them, publicly thank them for something I felt that they really gave me. They gave me a hug. My name is Margaret Krzyzewski. I've come from Fort Smith to try and help the people, help myself, first of all. And uh, what I've seen on film is really touching. I see two people who cared for each other so much, cared for their family so much, they had to make a change in their life. I feel like uh, a new person a little more strength, a little stronger, and stronger for being able to sit here and meet up with Andy and Phyllis. Very courageous people. I feel very deeply. I love you both for helping me out. Thank you. What did you see? What did you hear? And how did it make you feel? My name is Violet Beaulieu. Um, what I saw in the film was very touching. It made me feel, I felt so, I felt like crying. To see so many people getting hurt. It touches me right in my heart to see our people dying because of the bottle. Go see uh, Luminez Ushesi. The local Catholic priest, Father Lou Menez, was also touched by the film, to the point of sharing details of his past that most Fort Resolution people had never known for all the 30 or more years he's lived among them. I left home when I was 11 years old because I couldn't stand the street life in the city. Mom was found dead in our only room we had with no water, with no electricity, with no radio. Dad was found dead four years later in an abandoned building. Here, in further ocean, it seems to me, compared to that way of life, there is hope. 
the heartfelt confessions of a priest that he first got drunk when he was eight years old, then promised himself at age nine that he wouldn't drink again until he was old enough to think for himself. Today he is 63. He considers himself one of the elders of Fort Resolution, part of the family. Over the years, he's buried more than a hundred members of that family. The majority, because of alcohol, suicide, crime, uh, sickness because of alcohol and so forth. A serious message, but anyone who knows Lou Menez also knows his sense of humor, and he just can't sit down without making reference to one of the juicy bits of gossip in the Alkali Lake film. The alcoholic priest was having an affair with the nurse. Now be, a, be assured, I'm not alcoholic, I'm not fooling around with the nurses and June there. <laughs> Zeb Casaway of Snowdrift, another elder, one of the old, concerned about the young. Even I, standing up here, I feel kind of afraid. If I had never had been on the booze before, I wouldn't be afraid. You people are all still young now. You people all have to help yourself. Hi, my name is Paul Boucher. I'm from Fort Res. So I feel right now there's really lots of hope. Um, I could feel, I guess, that everybody's growing personally. I could feel I'm growing personally. And the community is growing. And I feel that, uh, I think that Andy and Phyllis are legends in their own time. The frustration, the fear, the jealousy, the enviness, I see it all in me. Chief Felix Lockhart of Snowdrift is one of the people who took it to heart when the Dene Nation made its call last year for sober leadership. Alcohol basically destroys everything. Once I sobered up, I was feeling lonely. I was feeling immature. I just like I was born again. This is now my fifth month of not drinking. And it's like I'm living again. There's only one way that we can do it, is by helping each other in our own community. It, it, really, it really is in our own community. And what does a community need to help itself? Fort Resolution already has much of what a community can use. In the evenings, there's the school gym. This night, many of the people from the workshop get in on the fun. Another evening, in another part of the school, a traditional feast. The tasty proof that many of the cultural activities of the people here are still strong. Later on, at the community hall, a fiddle dance. Here, there's all the proof you need that the little ones automatically take the lead from the big people. On other nights, they may have been learning to tip the bottle. Tonight, they are learning the steps and the beats of the favorite old songs. Across town, there's a community development drop-in center. Paul Boucher is one of the two alcohol counselors here, training under Elsie Verwick. The CD center is somewhere to go just to sit, and talk, and laugh, and drink coffee. And at least once a week, despite the weather, it is a quiet place for Alcoholics Anonymous to meet. On top of all that, this week the community has the free advice of Phyllis and Andy Chelsea. In their hometown of Alkali Lake, they learned the do's and don'ts of taking over from alcohol. Things such as, do push leaders to stop drinking. The leadership have to be sober and have to want to to follow through on anything they started. Don't wait for the government to make things happen. Phyllis learned this when she and her friend opened the band's first store. Uh, my friend and I used our, our own salary, which was, wasn't very much at all, to buy the first groceries that we got to stock up our first little store. Don't give a drunk person a job. Like we were forced to give uh, drunk people jobs when we first started because we were the only sober people around. I guess in 1978-79, we started, we started saying, OK, if you're not going to quit drinking, don't ask for a job. Don't play favorites. You don't just hire your family when jobs are available in the band. You pick the people that are the best for the job. 
Don't think that your work is done once the community is sober. Being sober and having nothing to do really is bad as being drunk and having nothing to do. See, with the sober community, economic development has to come in. You can't stop because somebody's sobered up. You have to get them something to do. Or we, our commitment as council now is to keep the people working. Do stop blaming. On the church, on our parents, on the bank council, on the governments, on other races. Uh, that rather than deal with it, and deal with it also in a good way, that people tend to, to find somebody to blame. And perhaps most importantly, don't think that no more booze means alcoholism is beat. We're saying right now the alcohol band has 95% sobriety. But we look at the kids, maybe 50% of the kids that were born for within that 95%, and they're already alcoholics. They were alcoholics before they were born. For nine months, maybe the mother was care maybe the mother was carrying them or drinking. So we're looking at at least 60 years to 100 years for complete uh, alcohol-free reserve. For people who came to this conference looking for advice, there was some, that the key to tackling alcohol abuse is simply to get started. And time and time again, they've been told it only takes two to do that. It only takes two to have a meeting. But there was other advice. Alkali Lake may be an inspiration and a good example, but people here in the north will have to find their own solutions. But there was also encouragement. People here were told that the north has special strengths to find those solutions. Phyllis and Andy Chelsea and the other resource people here say they have never been to a friendlier part of the country. They have never seen more open homes, more welcoming handshakes, more generosity. And perhaps most importantly of all, they say they have never been to a workshop where so many of the participants were men. Some were young men. Dave Giroux is from Fort Rez, but he's going to high school in Yellowknife. He was so anxious to get here that he sold his stereo so he could pay for his own ticket. Now that I've came to this workshop, I found out that it was a place where other people, other people shared their feelings. And I've learned a lot. I thought I was the only one that had these problems, so I took it out in alcohol. And, but as I took it out in alcohol, I hurt myself more, and I hurt the other people more too. Sholto Douglas thinks these workshops are the best thing that ever happened. That's the whole meaning of uh, workshops, I guess, you be able to share uh, your experiences and being, being able to help people and guide them as uh, each, each individual realizes that uh, there, there's better opportunities having a sober way of life. What does it add to this workshop to have people like Phyllis and Andy Chelsea here? A lot of, a lot, a lot of character, a lot of heart, determination, hope, love, inspiration, the whole, all that. It shows that if they can do it, and with their support and support of other people, we can do the same thing here in our community. Dawn Balsley is encouraged, and so is Jermaine Michelle. She's made a long drive from Pine Point every day to get here, sometimes in stormy weather. It's just unbelievable to say a dream come true. Like, you know, here are these people I watched on TV, and I'm actually sitting down talking to them. You know, I said, hey, listen, they were down there one day nowhere to turn and they left their alcohol and look where they are today and that's really amazing. Martha Many Grey Horses sums up the week as a celebration of well, life. For many people it's probably their first time to be in a type of workshop like this where they felt the safety and the comfort to share their experiences in the past and knowing that they have the support and the love and the concern of other people around them, and knowing that there is hope for the future. What, uh, Harold Belmont the thinks hope uh, lies in the young people. He's been to the alcohol workshops in all together. the Denny regions. But I think the driving force of a community in terms of uh, 
continuation or continuity is going to lie in the success of youth councils. I, uh, you look at uh, Charlie Barnaby's bunch up there in Fort Good Hope. I mean, that's a, that's a dynamite group. They're Cracker Jacks. You know, hey, we want to do this. And pretty soon them young people are bing, 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 bing. You know, they're setting up budgets and setting schedules and agendas. And uh, I, I, I had that same feeling here as you had a group of young people here in this youth council. They're ready to do some work. I think there's a contagious attitude that, that can grow. Contagious. Contagious attitude that, hey, we can do something about this problem. Not even the person who has coordinated and attended every workshop for the Denny Nation has become bored. It's just the opposite for Ethel Lamont. I have been reevaluating myself as a person and as a mother, as a wife, as a Denny woman. And um, it, it's really the people that have attended the workshops have really um, inspired me to, to continue on with the work that I've been doing. Somehow I, I, I feel that it's, um, it's the right time, you know, for our people to go ahead. There's, a, there's that hope. I, 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 can't, I cannot think that it's only our work at the denomination level that's doing it. You know, I feel that there's a good force involved. So with that, I'd like to uh, call Annie and Phyllis to receive this book. This is the way we like to show our appreciation right from our hearts, and even the people right from down the Mackenzie Valley up to the Arctic Ocean. This is a really a moving, and I think it's a moving experience to be able to show us the kind of love that you have for us. I think we all feel the same way with alcohol. Thank you very much. And I guess the special feeling I have in my heart is that all these things are beginning to happen. We are opening up to learning all those things from each other, making a stronger circle, making a bigger circle. There's so much more out there for us to be, be learning. As I find as adults today, we're still dealing with uh, the effects and the way our lives were when we drank. But we're also beginning to reach out. And the ones that are gonna come out ever so strong and ever so powerful are the young ones. So the things just keep moving. We keep that circle moving, believing in each other, being open to each other, and making that circle ever the more stronger and that there is no end, no end to all the special things that there, there, there is in life that we can make part of our own lives when we just make the circle a little stronger and we do it from caring, from openness, from trust.